Welcome to the second half of chapter 23. Or we're going to pick up with the five types of microevolution. So we talked about Hardy-Weinberg and how to maintain things at equilibrium, so no evolution. So now we're going to talk about kind of the opposite of those five things, which will lead to evolution. So the first of these is genetic drift. So this is when you have a small population, random things can affect the overall genetic distribution that you possess. So for instance, if you have a relatively small number of people that have a particular allele, and then one of those individuals drowns or doesn't reproduce or gets hit by a bus, then now that allele can disappear from the gene pool of that population. So this will affect small populations. That's why you want large populations if you're normally trying to keep things steady. Uh, and it typically reduces the amount of diversity we possess. So in this case, you can see a scenario yet again where we've got these reds versus the blues. And over time, you get fewer and fewer reds until eventually they kind of disappear. That's kind of the general drift when we talk about genetic drift. Now, there's two ways genetic drift can go down. The first is that you have one big event that just wipes out much of the original population. So you started off with kind of a happy, healthy, large population that was relatively stable. Volcanic eruption occurs, a new predator is introduced, something happens, a drought that limits the amount of food where most of the individuals are wiped out. So it's kind of like when you have a bottle and you try to pour something out, there's a lot of liquid in there, but only a small amount can get out because it bottlenecks. It's the same idea here. And so you're going to get this precipitous drop in population size. And based upon who makes it through, you typically get a corresponding decrease in genetic variability. This is why it's so dangerous when certain species uh, get to have a low population size because they lose a lot of their genetic diversity along the way. And that's kind of illustrated when you look at the picture here where you'll see we start off and we've got this big population with all these different colors and they're nice and pretty evenly distributed. And then as we go through and we start to limit the individuals that survive, as we kind of wheedle things down, you'll see that as we get to the end now, some of these things are gone, and then the resulting things that are left aren't necessarily spread out like they were before. So we went from something that was amazingly diverse and big to eventually a smaller population that's nowhere near as diverse and nowhere near as large. And the reason that we lost that is because we limited the population. If nothing happened to this population, there's no reason we'd have to end up here uh, at this last phase. So this will require some event to kind of trip things up. The other way is we start out with this nice big population that's happy and genetically healthy, and then it splinters. And what I mean is the, the big population is typically still there, but small populations kind of head out on their own and try to start their own things. So this is commonly called the founder effect because a small group of finches might have flown their way to the Galapagos Islands. It could be a queen goes off on her own to start a new hive. Whatever the case may be, we splinter that large population and we create several small ones from it. So this population is still fine, but these new populations, based upon which individuals ended up being in them when they first started, you can see here they can be dramatically affected either because when they first splintered, they just didn't happen to have a very good mix. So it'd be kind of like saying that you're going to have a, a bunch of people get shipwrecked. But if they're all almost identical, if they're all related, or they all happen to be the same ethnicity, you've lost a lot of variability because they're not very diverse in the first place. Uh, in some cases, too, once they get to this island where there's a smaller group of them, you can get where they can also lose the diversity that they had because regular old genetic drift can sit in. So even if we had more diversity amongst our group of 10 or 20 or 30 people that get stranded on the island, over time, based upon who lives and who reproduces, we can still end up, through chance, through a variety of things, losing some of that diversity. So at the end, we end up with, generally speaking, a lack of diversity. Uh, next thing is gene flow. This is just migration. So if you have something that is going to be immigration, which is going to be in, uh, this one's typically going to add to your gene pool. If you're talking about emigration, which I may or may not have spelled right, but we'll go with it, uh, where people are ultimately leaving, then typically that's going to reduce your genetics that are within your gene pool. And so migration is not just like a one-dimensional thing. It's about both coming in and leaving.
And if you're trying to get diversity, it's usually a good thing to have individuals move into the population. You know, you're, you're, it's basically like crossing when you've got different breeds or different lines of animals. They'll oftentimes try to cross so they're not just inbreeding. You don't want to just keep breeding the same animals with roughly the same individuals. And so it's great to get some immigration. That tends to make a population more diverse, better off. The problem is if you have a lot of people emigrating, you can lose some of that diversity as well. So you just have to be careful, but this does allow for mixing. If you're curious what the picture is, this is something Time did, where based upon the fact that we're now getting to a more global world and you're getting more and more intermixing of different ethnicities, races, whatever you want to consider them, uh, but people with different characteristics, you're starting to see that people are kind of moving towards kind of one more medium type thing where you'd have skin that's darker than, you know, me certainly because I'm pasty, uh, but, you know, somewhere kind of in the middle and facial features and such. You're getting a little bit more towards the middle. I don't know that you'll ever see enough of a mixing that you get to where most people are kind of this middle type person, but it's at least an interesting thought exercise to kind of run it through a, a software program and try to see what it comes up with if you just kind of meld the different traits that people have to see what you get if you mix them all together. We know that the blending theory is not uh, true, uh, so ultimately, keep in mind, you should take this with a grain of salt, but it's at least interesting that we are probably at least moving a little bit more towards this as we get to be more and more connected. Mutations. Mutations can lead to brand new alleles. So we've talked a lot about things before that tend to move around pre-existing alleles that tend to affect how common a pre-existing allele is but with mutations especially if they occur in a sex cell which means that if they occur in a sperm or egg the offspring that grows from that will have that particular trait in every cell of its body including its own gametes so it can pass it on so this is one of the ways that we can actually get brand new alleles so we can get variation that just did not exist before because we get a new trait like blue eyes 10,000 years ago or whatever, where this trait just wasn't there, there were no blue eyes, and then now we have it because of this mutation. This also tends to be one of the slowest ones if you're trying to get a lot of diversity, especially in humans, because we reproduce so slowly, this takes quite a while. So this isn't the best thing to rely on unless you're like a bacteria as your sole method of getting new traits, uh, but it is certainly an important one to get things that just did not exist before. Uh, here you can see a mutated and kind of messed up daisy, and this is an ebony chinchilla. They're typically a gray in nature, so this is a mutation of the coloration of their fur, which allows you to get other gorgeous fur coats and fur types, uh, assuming that you're harvesting them for their fur. We can assume you're also keeping them as pets. That, that's cool as well. Non-random mating. This is pretty much a reality. Uh, for all organisms, you don't just kind of stumble around and just say, all right, you. Uh, that's rarely going to happen, and if you were hoping for that, I'm, I'm sorry. But there's lots of ways this can happen. It can be inbreeding, where you just figure, like, why leave my house? If there's an available person of the other gender here, we could make babies. That's one possible way. Uh, that may seem odd for humans who have a very good awareness of the other people in their family and around them. But for other animals, like when people breed dogs, it's not that uncommon that you have some forms of inbreeding because they don't really seem to understand or have these uh, familial relationships like, hey, that's my mom or my sister or whatever else. The, a lot of animals have a much more basic brain and they seem to just work on the level of, that's a girl, I'm a guy, rock on. Uh, so inbreeding oftentimes will occur if nothing else, just convenience. Assortative mating is when individuals tend to mate with other individuals that are like them. Uh, so this can occur where you might be raised amongst people that have specific characteristics. It could be tall people. It could be skin tone or facial features. It could be behavior attitudes. And so oftentimes you will be more predisposed to find people that are similar to that and to mate with them. And so you tend to mate most often with individuals like you, assortative mating. And so the end result of this is certain traits tend to be favored. Uh, and in some cases, if you're talking about things like inbreeding, it tends to favor people who are homozygous. In this case, with inbreeding that we do at least, uh, in some cases you see in nature, you'll focus on individuals that are homozygous for the best traits, you know? So they're homozygous good individuals. And in some of those cases, you can be favored. Uh, anytime you do inbreeding, you're going to end up with a lot of homozygotes as children. That's kind of the problem, is if there's a lot of negative traits, like homozygous recessive, 
those can tend to creep up as well. But both of these type of conditions here will be what's going to happen, and in many cases the result of this idea of non-random mating. So some traits will become more common and they'll tend to become more homozygous typically because of non-random mating. So this is extreme inbreeding here where you had an individual mated, then they mated that individual with the daughter, then they mated that individual with the granddaughter. So I mean, this is really getting kind of odd. Uh, don't do that at home. And then natural selection, the differential survival as well as reproduction. If you wanna make it to reproductive age, you have to survive that long. And so in this case, you can see there's the darker moths that stand out if you are the bird. After the Industrial Revolution, you had where the darker moths, so the peppered moths, would blend in, and the lighter colored moths now stood out. And so you saw the population went from almost entirely light colored moths to almost entirely dark colored moths just because of this, whoever stood out. And so natural selection will occur, and natural selection is not random. This happens for a reason. It's because you possess certain traits that make you better able to live to adulthood and reproduce. So this is not just like a random thing where the color didn't matter. No, the color you were mattered big time. Uh, and this is one of the only ways that's going to allow you to specifically adapt to your environment. Because the reason that you survived or didn't was because of your environment. Uh, so if your environment's really cold, the guys that probably have the thickest fur or the thickest layer of fat underneath their skin, they'll probably live. You know, realistically, they'll reliably survive longer. Individuals that don't will die off much more reliably. So it's not going to be random, and it will make them better off as a population now to cope with their environment. Now, the key thing to remember, though, is the environment consistently changes. So you can't assume that you, like, evolve and you're like, now I'm awesome and I'm awesome forever. You're just awesome until the next time it changes. And at that point, everything's up for grabs now because you don't know if that trait's gonna be beneficial anymore, and so things can continue to kind of shift and move. And that leads us to a little bit of a debate we're gonna get here. Populations need variation, and they need it for a reason, because they have to have variance so they can adapt. So if the conditions change, they're able to change with it. If everybody was one particular type that was suited for the environment just as it is, if the environment changes, no one would have survived that change. They all would have died or they all would have lived. There would be kind of no leeway. But instead in populations, we tend to see polymorphisms. So these are just multiple traits, multiple different forms within any given population. So we don't just have one particular type of person. We've got tall and short and dark skin and light skin and different colored hair and all that stuff. You'll also see that we'll see these changes oftentimes will occur in regards to geography. So this is kind of cool. You can get things like ring species, where in this case, we've got one particular type of this organism. And as you move geographically, conditions change. So this could be like going up a mountain. So as you go up, it gets colder typically, a little bit less oxygen. Uh, it could be that there's different amounts of rainfall in an area. And so based upon how much rainfall you get, but based on these differences, you get subtle differences in the populations. Now, in some cases, these subtle differences can be enough to give rise to a series of related species that are each distinct. Or in some cases, you get a ring species where ultimately it's one species with a bunch of kind of subgroups, each of which in many cases will, will reproduce with individuals near it, but not everybody. So for instance, there's a type of uh, Encetina, a type of salamander in the Sierra Nevadas, where the guys that are kind of here, so we'll say at point one, they're glad to reproduce with each other as well as the guys at point two in some cases, the ones that are next to them as they wrap around a uh, mountain range. And then the guys at two will reproduce somewhat with ones, lots with the twos, and a little bit with the threes. And this process continues. But when it wraps back around, the guys that are now five will not mate with the ones. They've become different enough over this kind of gradual shift that the guys in the end don't recognize each other. And this really drives home what I'll say a lot is that the idea of species is useful for us to kind of organize stuff in our mind, but it doesn't really exist in nature in the sense that we'd like to think it does. You know, species is still a very flexible concept that we try to wrap our heads around for our own benefit, but in reality, it's just a bunch of different populations behaving like populations do. And if you kind of extract yourself from the, the constraints of species, it's kind of cool just to understand that these guys just happen to see other ones and twos as being them. You know, if you're a two, you'd see a one, two, and three as being you, you know, they're, they're able to mate with. And that this continues, but if you're a one and a five, you're different enough that even though you're both salamanders, 
Even though you probably recognize that guy is kind of like you, you don't recognize them as a potential mate. And so you just don't mate. And it's no big deal. It's just evolution created this kind of scenario that we see. It makes sense regardless, but it makes it difficult to decide if this is one species or a bunch of different species or exactly what to do with it. And so it's just kind of a fun one when you see some of these geographical variants as far as how do we classify them, how many species should they be, should it be one, should it be five, and there'll be lots of debate about that. And there's nothing wrong with that. And then as I brought up before, we want to preserve a lot of this variation that we have to make sure it's there if we need it later. And so ways of doing this is diploids, because we can have heterozygotes that contain a lot of these recessive alleles but don't express them, so they don't have to die, uh, even if it's negative at the time. We also have balanced polymorphism, where oftentimes heterozygotes have an advantage called hybrid vigor. A really good example of this is we've talked about sickle cell, where if you kind of have one dominant and one recessive, it's the best combo, where you don't have sickle cell anemia, but you also have resistance to malaria. So if you're in this kind of malaria belt here, so you can see it's towards the middle-ish, you can see most of the land on Earth is a little bit north, uh, but in general around the middle of the planet, there's a strip there where you have malaria. And so within those areas, it's most advantageous to be a heterozygote or hybrid. And so this idea of hybrid vigor encourages many organisms to try to make sure they're mixing up their genetics and they're keeping around plenty of these heterozygotes that can store this extra genetic info. There's also frequency dependent selection where individuals that are rare oftentimes have their own unique charm, if you will. Uh, I can best explain this where if somebody gets popular, where everybody's like, oh my gosh, I love this band. Eventually when they get popular enough, people start to turn on them. People like to like, discover a band, you know, the hipsters of the world. And this seems to apply to most animals that a lot of the oddballs do seem to hold a particular charm for at least some of the ladies and it helps keep them around. And so if you, everybody loves brown eyes, but you happen to have blue eyes, there's a good chance some of the females will still adore the fact that you're different, that you've got those blue eyes, and still reproduce with you to help keep these things around. So frequency dependent selection, things get too popular, they start to become less popular really. And we've got a couple things here, I think we got one more after this. Natural selection, there's, well, fitness just is your ability to pass on your genetics to the next generation. So how much of the next generation comes down to your genetics relative to all the other people that we're trying to reproduce? So a really fit individual is really good at, at having lots of babies that themselves can survive and thrive. Uh, fitness, if you are awesome but sterile, is zero. To have fitness, you have to be able to reproduce. Now natural selection itself, though, has three general ways it can pan out. So if I'm trying to see how this natural selection thing is going to work, three ways. Uh, the first one here that we'll discuss, which is actually the bottom one here, uh, is directional selection. And so this is where one of the extremes is favored. So if you've got where the trees are relatively tall and there's not a lot of food on the ground, you might select the biggest individuals that can reach the most of the, the tree's leaves. They survive. And so overall, we start off with our initial bellish curve, typically. And what we're going to do is favor one extreme to push it to one side. So instead of us having the average size guy that's, we'll say, six foot tall here, we now get to where the average size guy is going to be like 12 foot tall. That's directional. One extreme is favored. So one extreme is what's good. Uh, when we talk about diversifying selection, that's going to be where both extremes are good. So the middle is really what's bad. And so in this case, this actually can lead to speciation more than probably the other two. So in this case, you might have where this individual is like tan, you can see here, so that might be good camouflage. You might have gray as good camouflage. But if you have both of those colors mixed together, you might not have anywhere that you blend in. So these guys in the middle are getting killed off, but the two guys on either side of things are surviving. Or it could be size. Maybe the big enough guys can fight off the predators. The small enough guys can hide. But the guys in the middle just suck. And so those guys die off, and we end up with two populations because two extremes are favored. Both extremes are favored. Now, a stabilizing selection, this one works best with stuff like birth. You don't want a really small baby. They tend to die more frequently. You don't want a really big baby because that tends to die and kill the mother in the process of birth if we don't have medical care. So you really want it to be right in the middle, Goldilocks style. And so in this case, it's stabilizing because it favors neither extreme. And so this one, no extreme is going to be favored. You want to be right in the middle. And so birth weight happens to be a really good example that humans have where you want a baby that's probably about six to eight pounds.
If you start getting much smaller or much bigger, you can run risk of complications for the baby or the mother or both, and that leads to more individuals that are dying off uh, that are doing those particular traits. In this case, having really big babies or really small babies. So that's stabilizing. And our very last slide. Uh, in some cases, we see adaptations that don't seem to make you better for your environment. So this is counterintuitive. The whole purpose of natural selection is to make you able to, to thrive in your environment. But occasionally we'll see where these males and females typically look different, sexual dimorphism, two morphs, two forms. And so we'll see these cases where the male and the female of a species don't look alike. And the male typically, sometimes female, but rarely, the male typically has things that oftentimes make no sense. You know, he's got like these bright colors, you know, he's got these elaborate tail feathers that are not only bright colors, they take a lot of energy to make, they make you more visible, they make it harder to fly. Uh, you can talk about like the antlers on deer in many cases where they take a lot of energy and you use them to smash into other guys. And so a lot of these traits can actually be negative. But the reason they seem to stick around is because individuals that possess them get chosen by females to reproduce more than others. And so females are essentially selecting these traits because they think that they're pretty or whatever else. And in some cases, they do have a valid point. Like, for instance, this train on a peacock is horrible. Horrible. But if you can manage to grow a gigantic train and survive to reproduction, you've got to have really good other genes. And so they are selecting for a trait that's actually really bad for the individual bird, but it's also in some cases a useful way, not always, sometimes it appears to just be ornamental, but in many cases having that negative trait and still surviving seems to be a useful way of making sure all their other genes are really good so that you're picking a good male. And so that's why the females will tend to pick the males that have a really good spread of tail feathers. Now in some cases like the Irish elk that used to get like these huge, I want to say it's like 12 foot uh, across antlers, it appears that that may have actually partially led to their extinction because they got such extremes that the amount of energy there made them vulnerable to changes. So if something bad happened, they were so disadvantaged by trying to lug around these huge antlers that it made it easier to kill them off. And so this can in some cases be a double-edged sword. It's not always so horrific, like that guy is just brightly colored. As long as he can fly fast and you know pay attention to his surroundings, he might be okay. Uh, but some of them can be very involved and very serious, such as the peacock. But sexual selection is how we explain that. It's not the environment, it's the ladies. Take it easy, guys.